This program is part of the PBS Democracy Project. I would say that I face the toughest issue that this state has ever seen, and I haven't flinched once. I think most Vermonters want what's best for this state, and I believe in the end they will choose to take the power back into their own hands and run their state. Put your fears aside, vote your hopes. When you vote for the person that you really want to see win, we are all winners. Three different candidates, three different characters, three very different choices. Who are these people, and how do their pasts affect what they want for Vermont's future? This year's candidates for governor offer voters a distinct choice, Vermont's choice. Incumbent Governor Howard Brush Dean III, who turns 52 November 17th, was born in New York City. Although he and his three younger brothers spent summers at the family home in East Hampton on Long Island, during the school year, most of their time was spent in the city at their Park Avenue apartment. Living in the city wasn't so great. There was nothing to do. It's, I think it goes back to why I hate the city so much. You'd come home after school, you couldn't do anything. You know, you had a couple hours of homework and then you know, if you're into museums and all that, that's great, but you get tired of that after a while. His mother, Andre, raised the four boys at home. Dean's father, Howard Jr., like his father before him, worked on Wall Street as a stockbroker. The Dean boys were close. Howard is the oldest. His brother, Bill, now a bond salesman in Boston, is the youngest. Certainly, we had our share of pillow fights. Uh, many were, you know, by invitation. And, uh, you know, that was considered great sport. Uh, I don't know how my mother quite handled the whole thing because, uh, you know, my father used to encourage us. Uh, he'd come home early from work just so we could all watch the Three Stooges together. Most of it was you make your own recreation. We had no television, which was wonderful. We relied on ourselves to entertain ourselves. Well, you know, as the oldest, he was a leader, uh, certainly when we were teenagers. He was a little apart from the rest of us in the sense that he was the older one. He probably worked a lot harder in school than some of us did. All four of the Dean boys went to St. George's Prep School in Rhode Island. Howard was active in student affairs and sports like track, wrestling, and football. His yearbook caption could hold true today. If you're the curious type who can put up with a temper, join the few who know me from the inside looking out. After prep school, Howard, like his father and grandfather, went to Yale. However, spending the previous summer in England on scholarship affected his freshman year and later life. I made friends, uh, and one of them was African, uh, Nigerian actually. He got me very interested in race, because before I'd really had no contact with African Americans of any kind. Um, you know, this was the 60s, and this was not a time when there was much integration. So I asked for an African-American roommate, and I got two. Roommates Don Roman and Ralph Dawson contributed to Howard's education. Looking back on it, it was one of the great experiences of my life. It was a very difficult experience, as I'm sure it was for them as well. It gave me a much different viewpoint into what it was like to live as a member of a minority. And I think that has something to do with the reason I signed the Civil Unions Bill as well. Howard had fun at Yale, but he also taught at an inner city school in New Haven. I had taught middle school in an inner city New Haven school. It was very, very tough. And anybody who thinks teachers are overpaid and don't do much work is crazy. Eventually, he would decide not to pursue a teaching career. He graduated in 1971 with a degree in political science. Before deciding what to do next, it was off to Aspen to ski bum for a winter. I poured concrete and washed dishes and skied every 80 days. And it was great, but it wasn't the lifestyle for me. Uh, I'm somebody that has to be doing something constructive all the time. I actually, I'm incapable of just having fun. Again, following the path of his father and grandfather, Howard went to work as a stockbroker, but he wasn't satisfied. I enjoyed it intellectually, but I didn't see the contribution I was going to make doing that, managing other people's money. Making money is something that's not 
have never interested me that much. So Howard decided to be a doctor, enrolling at Albert Einstein University in New York City. I quit my job and moved back in with my parents, and then I went to a three-year medical school because, you know, by that time I was 25 years old and I thought it was time to get going. After graduation, Howard came to Burlington to do his internship and residency. I ended up here uh, because I was cross-matched to Vermont with a computer. Vermont had a very good uh, ambulatory care program, which I was really interested in. Howard met his wife, Judith, while in medical school. I saw her at the front of the class, which she got a 98 in and I got a 33 in, or 34, 33 was passing. She was always the brains of the family. And I thought she was really adorable. We were very close. We have a lot of the same values. We think completely differently, which drives us both crazy. Dr. Judith Steinberg chooses to stay out of public life. My happy marriage is more important than a happy political career in, in the long run, so uh, I figure if she wants to be a full-time physician and not get into politics, why should she? Howard, too, is a very private person. His friends say he does have balance in his life. We are like brothers. We're very close friends. We can tell the other person what they don't want to hear, and uh, we've fulfilled that role for each other. Well, he's competitive, and I'm competitive, but he fights fair. I've tried to get him to play tennis or basketball or golf, the sports that I like, but uh, he won't do it because he, he knows I'll beat him, so he's a very competitive guy. <laughs> well, that's because I don't like all those, I don't like sports like golf and tennis. I just like to be outdoors all the time. Although the truth is, to be completely truthful about tennis, is I was never very good at it, and my wife is pretty decent. The last tennis match I had played, she beat the daylights out of me, and I never played again. So maybe they're right. Maybe there's something to all this. Howard is a no-frills guy. You know, he bought a canoe a few years ago, and you would have thought he would bought a 40-foot yacht the way he was talking about having made the purchase. Uh, but I think that goes along with the fact that he, he, he sees himself as, uh, as an everyday person and, and not someone who is a cut above and, or entitled to something more than other people. He doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. doesn't drink coffee. He's a health nut. I don't know anybody else who's uh, canoed the Connecticut River all the way north to south with his kids. Uh, he goes hiking and camping with them, obviously, and is so much a part of their hockey and soccer lives, maybe too much a part of their hockey lives. Um, but he's a, he's a great father, and um, they are lucky kids. Nice job, girls. Nice job. Nice. All right, All right Mick. I try to get to most of them, and until this year, I succeeded. This is a hard campaign, so I haven't been to as many as I'd like. But most of the time, I get to the vast majority of the games. I live for it. One of my most favorite activities. Good. Right on it. Right on it. Good. All right. All right. It's an incredible place to live. Uh, and it's, it's a great place for me to be. I'm not a particularly formal person. Um, I love the outdoors. Every moment of my life that I'm not having to work, I'm outdoors doing something. Come on, Violet! Come on! Here's Lola wants one. Come on, come on, Eddie. Violet! Ruth Dwyer and Howard Dean are political opposites. But they both love the outdoors on, and say that's why they're here. Oh, there she's going to sit, look. See how she sits? What a good pig to sit like that. Not every pig can sit. Ruth was born 42 years ago in Painesville, Ohio, to Charlotte and Richard Cook. The family, including older brother Robert, didn't linger long in Ohio and headed east to Glens Falls, New York. My dad was in insurance, so there was a while when he was moving around a lot um, for various reasons. So we did live in Glens Falls when I was very young, and then we lived in Shelburne, Vermont, and my mom taught there at the village school. She went back to work when I was in first grade, and that was actually unusual in those days. Most women didn't work, and most moms didn't work. Uh, but since she was a teacher, it wasn't that big a deal, because when we were home, she was home with us. And then when I was probably 12, I think, uh, he, my dad got a 
an offer to buy into an insurance business back in New York State again. So he did that, and at the same time, uh, that same year, um, bought this place here in Thetford. Ruth's family may have moved to Rockville Center out on Long Island, but Ruth's heart stayed in Vermont, on the farm in Thetford, where the family spent weekends and summers. This was really home for me. I did not like New York. I hated to leave Vermont, and I just didn't like it there, never liked it there. From the beginning, Ruth did not seem to fit into life on suburban Long Island. She was talented, so she appears too good to be true. And at the same time, she has some very strong convictions because even at 14, even at 15, she went home and thought about what's right, what's wrong. Steve Kleinman and Ruth Cook met in ninth grade and are still close today. Outwardly, we're very different. I mean, she comes from a WASP-type background, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, you know, Mayflower-type people <laughs> like I'm from. You know, my family from the tenements in New York City and Jewish. But it was our core values, and she loves to laugh, and I love to make her laugh. And that was pretty much our friendship. And we, uh, in a sense, we needed each other. We were confidants. She did not enjoy living on Long Island. You know, Ruth has little tolerance for people who are pretentious and shallow and superficial. But what happens is she was threatening. And she doesn't intend to be, but women particularly found Ruth extremely threatening because she's good looking, she's bright, she's athletic, she's respected by, by the adults. The teachers adored Ruth, every single one. She was always their favorite. And it was because of her intellect and her commitment. So what happens is people want to take her down. Didn't bother Ruth, didn't bother Ruth, except to the extent that it only reinforced her desire to go back to Vermont. At the age of 17, she persuaded her parents to let her move to the farm by herself, spending senior year at Thetford Academy. You know, her family wanted her to go to Ivy League school. I mean, her mother went to Brown, her father went to Yale, her brother went to Dartmouth. You bet they expected that of her. And you know what, I think she expected that out of her at first. But also Ruth has this connection to the land. I mean, that's just, it's in her blood, it always was, and it always will be. So Ruth stayed in Vermont, and after graduating from Thetford Academy in 1976, went to UVM to study animal science. But she did not feel comfortable there either. I've often joked I think I was the only pickup truck on the UVM campus with a Reagan bumper sticker. Ruth left before the end of her freshman year. I've always been kind of that kind of person where if I can see the value of something, I'll work really hard on it. But if it's a waste of time, I just won't. You know, it's not somebody else's standard that matters to me. I, I can decide what's important and what isn't. And if it's not important, wasting time really bothers me. I can't stand to waste time. She is half her father and half her mother. Her dad was kind of larger than life. He just emanated strength. You know, a brilliant man, you know, went to Yale, the son of an English professor, uh, very, very private with his opinions and his beliefs. If you ask, he'll share it, but he wouldn't share it with you. He wouldn't volunteer it, unlike, you know, her mother, who's a cross between Jane Addams and Aunt B from Mayberry RFD, and that's who she is. And with her, it's very different. You know, with her, it's the compassion that Ruth got. You know, they're very modest people, and Ruth is a very modest person, so she gets her strength from her dad, in a sense, her quiet strength. She gets her compassion from her mom. After UVM, Ruth went to an equestrian school in England for three months and then returned to Thetford, where she's lived ever since. In 1984, she married her veterinarian, John Dwyer, who had been taking care of her animals. They opened a clinic on the farm, but are currently separated after 16 years of marriage. I love them both, and um, they're just very different people, and they just headed in different directions. John is quite a bit older than Ruth too and you know and I think that can make a difference in life too so but they're very very good people. Today Ruth's mother lives in a cabin on the farm where Ruth raises cattle and sheep, cares for her huge herd of pets and gives riding lessons. Feeling comfortable? 
All right, let's put your outside hand on your pommel. I think we'll go This right is where ahead. I like to be. And even when I'm campaigning, I can be gone all day. I, I will still drive home to spend the night at home. And then away from me. That looks beautiful. Good girl. Good job. I can't think of a better place to, to raise kids or to, uh, to have a family. 48-year-old Anthony Polina is also a Vermonter by choice. I really enjoy Vermont. You know, I've traveled other places and uh, I don't think there's anywhere quite like it. Like the others, he grew up south of here in the town of Glenrock, New Jersey. The Polina household was a busy place. We were an Italian family, and uh, it was a lot of talking, always a lot of noise, everybody talking at one time. But uh, I would say almost every weekend, uh, we would tend to get together with uh, our family, with aunts and uncles and our cousins, and have a family gathering literally every weekend. And I think that kind of strong, uh, knit, close-knit family is also important. And I think that's the kind of thing that allows you to build the strength, that then allows you to go out into the world and, and do other things. Anthony's mother and two of his three brothers still live near Glen Rock. He was stronger. He was a very good baby. He was quiet, just like he is now. He was pretty nudgy when he was little. Like if we went out and his strap didn't touch his shoulder the right way, he would like, mm, mm, you know, he was very nudgy until I straightened it out. Anthony's father, Sal, was a busy accountant, but he did find time for the family. I think having four boys in the house is a challenge probably for, for any group, any parents. Um, and I really respected the way my father was willing to allow us to grow up and become our, our own persons. One thing about my mother particularly, she was always willing to stick up for her family and for her sons, and you really have to respect that. Because they were really good. My husband was quiet, but he was also stern. And we just never had any problem. Because if we did, I would have quit after two. <laughs> Brother Bobby was the youngest, then Anthony. John was next, and Raymond the oldest. If I had to pick one of us that was the most strong-willed, I would say it was him. If he had a point to put across, there was no, you know, there was no turning back. That was it. He made his point, and he was going to drive that point home. That's the kind of guy he was. What he believes, he really believes in. You know, he's not just saying it to impress people. The four Polina boys went to high school a block from their house. One of the school bullies was looking for him. And uh, as the older brother, I said, well, you know, I'll go check this guy out and go find him, see if I can get him off your back. And he said, no. He said, this is my problem. And he went out, he confronted the guy, looked the guy in the face, said to him, what's the problem you have with me? The guy backed down, and that was the end of the situation. I think he's handled pretty much everything else the same exact way. If he sees something wrong or he sees a problem, he doesn't back away from it. He goes right at it, and he solves the problem as fast and as quick as he can. After graduating from high school in 1970, Anthony went to college in New York State and traveled to Europe and Switzerland. Then he visited a friend going to college in southern Vermont. I knew very um, early on uh, being here that Vermont was a place that I, I wanted to stay. So I, I acted upon that, uh, that pretty quickly and uh, found myself coming back for the next semester. After two years at Wyndham College, Anthony transferred to Johnson State where he majored in environmental studies and graduated in 1977. And boy, he went to Vermont and he said, don't ever expect me to come back to New Jersey. He said, I would never live in New Jersey again. He just loved everything about it, the people, the, the weather, the environment, he just loved it. Anthony met his wife, Deb Wolf, while the two were teaching in Montpelier in the early 80s. I think I sensed right in the very beginning, he's just a very sensitive, caring person. And um, I think that's probably what drew me towards him when we first met. 
They now have two girls and live in Middlesex. We're animal lovers in our family. <laughs> My oldest daughter spends a lot of time caring for animals at the Humane Society. Um, a real strong commitment after school on Saturdays. Um, and uh, in this particular case, we have uh, four puppies that were foster caring for the next four weeks because they were taken away from their mothers and they're still too young to, to go out to a home. So we often have uh, animals in the house. Anthony is really an amazing father. He's just the most devoted man I have ever watched. Um, he's a great cook. He's incredibly supportive of his, of his children. And uh, that's just the hardest thing for him right now is, is spending more time away from them. Anthony's always chosen jobs where he could have the flexibility to have a lot of family time. And that's another thing that I, I love about him, that I feel that he's got his priorities really straight. They may all love Vermont, but they are all from away. We haven't had a native-born governor since Dean Davis. Way back, was elected in 68 and re-elected in 1970. And my suspicion is that uh, Vermont is uh, willing to have out-of-staters, you know, run the state of Vermont. Period. It's a teeny tiny town, it's the smallest state capital in America, only two streets. You know exactly what they're doing in Montpelier. But when it comes to Washington, a city with all of its very temptations and, and potential for corruption, just send our own people. Well, I was always interested in politics. Howard Dean first got involved in politics by helping out Jimmy Carter's re-election campaign. I had a little extra time, so I volunteered um, in the local office in Burlington, just licking stamps and things like that, and got to know a ton of people. Including Peggy Hartigan and her sister, Democratic committee woman and state senator Esther Sorrell. They were known as the den mothers of the Democratic Party. My mom was just passionately interested in political process. I didn't find out that our dining room table was for eating until I was close to high school. I thought it was for holding voter checklists and for, you know, stuffing envelopes for political candidates. They really were my mentors here, particularly Esther. Uh, Esther and Peggy had this essentially this Rolodex in their head of everybody who was worth knowing in the Democratic Party all over the state. And they gave me all their numbers and told me to call them. And I called them up and I said, gee, I'm going to run for national delegate for the convention. And of course, they'd never heard of me. They'd call and check with Peggy and Esther. And they said, oh, yes, he's just great. So I was elected. And the only people who had uh, higher vote totals were Madeline Cunin and Esther Sorrell. She really liked the fact that he was a guy who was a Yale-educated doctor who's working in the old North End in Burlington in a medical clinic. And she said, this is a guy whose values I like. And then, personality-wise and energy-wise, he was a guy who had passion. And that was, that was what my mother was all about, too. They did everything for me, uh, and they really helped me an enormous amount. Um, I think a lot of people were surprised that I got in the legislature after only living in the state for, I think, you know, three or four years. And it was because of Esther and Peggy. I mean, it is going to take an act of the legislature, and I think the legislature is the proper place for this kind of a discussion. Dean served two terms in the House, and then in 1986, ran for lieutenant governor. Why would a doctor want to be involved in politics? I'm Lieutenant Governor Howard Dean. I got involved for three reasons, to protect our kids. He won that election, and went on to win re-election two more times after that. Of course I'm going to vote for Howard Dean. He's done the most for seniors, and besides that, he still makes house calls. We will do our best. Howard thought about running for higher office, but decided not to. What happened was that in 1990, Madeline Cunin retired from the governorship, and I thought of running. Um, and one of the reasons I didn't run was um, because I didn't know how to close my medical practice. Lieutenant Governor Howard Dean, a Democrat, will assume the office of governor. He is 42 years so old. So the odd thing that happened was Governor Snelling died suddenly and unexpectedly the following August, and I became governor. I never got the chance to decide whether to close my medical practice or not. It was closed on the spot. Dean assumes the office of governor automatically under the Vermont Constitution. By precedent, he will take the oath of office in just a few minutes. 
I'm going to have a lot to learn. Do you feel prepared to be governor? I don't think anybody's ever prepared to be governor until they become governor. I, I have served for 10 years in the legislature and as lieutenant governor, so i probably as prepared as, as anybody, but I don't think there's any such thing as someone who's prepared to be governor, and I think Dick Snelling would be the first person to have said that. Um, it's uh, they're big, very, very big shoes to fill. Hi, Howard Dean. That was 1991. Howard Dean has been governor ever since. But I will faithfully execute the office of governor for the state of Vermont. For Ruth Dwyer, it was her goddaughter that got her started in politics. She went through the first grade, and by the end of first grade, she didn't read. And, you know, they came back and said, well, she can't move on. She's going to have to repeat the first grade. And now this is just a bright child. If you can't send a child there that's a reasonably bright, intelligent, happy child um, and, you know, get something basic like reading skills, we got a problem. And that was why I ran for the school board. She ran and won. But her tenure on the Thetford School Board was a bit stormy. In fact, opponents taped all meetings. You are constantly saying, I know of schools, I know of places to do this. You know, I'm the only one that does my homework, though. And it's difficult to talk to I remember the first school board meeting I went to after I won uh, was just like, you know, like I, I can sympathize with someone being black or being a minority because that's how I felt. I'm sitting in that room. I felt like I was the only person there that was not wanted, you know, that wasn't good enough because they had their own little group and I wasn't a part of it. And nothing I did or said could ever bring me up to their standard of what they were looking for. Ruth dares to say what she believes is right. Somebody else may have a different opinion and she certainly listens to that. I mean, and I've heard her listen to that and not demean someone. Um, she has many liberal friends that come to this house, you know, that like her personally. They may not agree with her politically, but they like her personally. In a controversial and bitter contest, Ruth did not win re-election to the school board. That defeat prompted her to run for the Vermont House. People were feeling really powerless and hopeless almost. They felt like they, they, I had given them some hope that both sides were going to be heard and they were heard for two years and then all of a sudden I was gone and there was nobody to speak for that piece of the community that wanted a voice. And they were feeling really, really bad about that. Uh, and I felt like, you know, if you don't do anything, if you just give up, they will give up. But if you go right back out there and run for higher office, then they have hope again. You know, then you can re-energize these people before they give up on everything. So that's what I did, and it worked. Ruth went on to serve two terms in the Vermont House. She made a big splash as freshman, winning a seat on the Appropriations Committee. She was not reappointed, but won a strong ally in Lola Aiken, the wife of former U.S. Senator and Governor George Aiken. I was at the State House, and I ran into her, and she asked me, um, aren't you the one that goes to the corner coffee shop, the coffee corner, actually? And I said, if you want to go, give me a call, and I'll be there. And the minute she got there, the fellows loved it. She's not dull. She's always made me feel positive about public service, um, the way she talks about George Ake and her husband. It, it makes you feel positive about it, like you can be a good person, you can be an honest person, you can be someone with integrity, and actually achieve something. She's smarter than people give her credit for. Uh, she really is very intelligent. Maybe people think she's too conservative, and maybe she is, but I thought this year, she had loosened up a lot. Obviously, she is a threat, or people wouldn't be as concerned who are running against her. Clearly, um, going to high school in the 1960s and uh, uh, being involved and experiencing the anti-war movement um, was certainly a, an eye-opener and something that uh, began to get, I think, a lot of us thinking about politics differently and getting involved. Being at Johnson State College, I really got a first-hand introduction to a lot of people who were very much involved in, in shaping Vermont politics, from 
Pat Leahy to Bernie Sanders to Dick Snelling and a, and a lot of people in between. Ironically, those courses were taught by Bill Doyle, a Republican state senator from Washington County. He was a very good student, very inquisitive. During a lifetime, almost all of us get involved in certain issues, but at his age, he seemed to be involved in uh, many, many issues. Certainly Bill Doyle opened my eyes to a lot of the goings-on in Vermont politics. Uh, the kind of opportunities he provided to go beyond book learning um, and to really experience firsthand uh, Vermont politics and uh, some of the characters in Vermont politics was, was very important. Anthony went on to direct and teach at a small private high school in Montpelier. I really think that was the hardest job I ever had because I'm constantly trying to do the right thing for this group of kids who had a, a variety of needs. It's a winning campaign because we've registered thousands of new voters. And then in 1984, Anthony decided to run for Congress as a Democrat against Jim Jeffords. He gained national attention for spending the least amount of any congressional candidate in the country. Jeffords opponent, Anthony Polina, proposed the limitation. It means the two of them will buy no media. They'll just stump the state, go door to door, a kind of low budget campaigning that still works up here. We raised a lot of important issues and built a lot of respect um, you know, for our issues as well as I think for me as a, as a candidate. Um, and we were going up against a very, very strong in incumbent. Um, and so we lost that campaign, but that, that was not a, a big loss. It seems as if Jim Jeffords is gonna go back to Washington for another term, but it also seems really clear to me that this campaign has been a very successful campaign it's a winning campaign because it's the lowest spending congressional campaign in the country. <laughs> His next race was for state representative. Anthony campaigned hard, but lost by only 20 votes. I'll tell you, that was a much tougher loss because it was so close. Because you wonder about, you know, if there's just those 10 people that thought about it differently. Ultimately, I do see it all as a, as a growth process. Obviously, none of it um, discouraged me from continuing to, to be involved in, in politics. Anthony had more success setting up the farm advocacy group Rural Vermont. Besides holding news conferences and benefits, Rural Vermont tackled property tax issues for farmers, eventually getting a bill passed which taxes farmland for its current use instead of its development potential. It's been a, a, a big relief to the farmers as far as taxis goes. It, uh, and it was one of the things that has helped probably the most of anything they have done was the land use on uh, agricultural land. Jack Starr was a longtime dairy farmer in the town of Troy. He credits his nephew, lawmaker Bobby Starr, and Anthony with helping to save family farms. He, uh, he knew a lot more about farming than I did, and I'd farmed all my life. He had knew the technical part of it, and uh, he helped us tremendously getting these things through, along with my nephew. They'd done a real good job. I think I owe a lot of uh, the work that I've done in, in Vermont politics in recent years uh, to the support that I received from, from Jack at uh, an important time in the development of my, my political activism. You know, Jack's not someone that people would see as a radical Vermonter, uh, but he's someone who is not uh, afraid to stand up and, and speak his mind and not afraid to work with people like myself. Yeah, I learned a lot from Anthony. I learned that we can't stay at home and think that the other guy's going to do it. We had to get involved. I particularly remember one meeting in St. Albans. Every farmer in town was there, and one of the farmers looked up at me and he said, you know, Mr. Polina, the problem is no one in Montpelier listens to us. And to me, that was really a watershed experience. And I said, well, if they're not listening to you, who are they listening to? He was a kid that was going around the world, and you know, he'd been in Australia for nine months. He was doing his kind of wandering thing, and then he just got in the wrong place at the wrong time. Charlie Dean, one of Howard's younger brothers, was killed in 1974. He's classified as a POW MIA. 
the question was, was he in the CIA? And nobody, of course, going to know the answer to that question. We don't think so. Um, but uh, he and an Australian friend were traveling down the Mekong River in Laos during the war, and they were captured, and then they were held for three months and then killed. When something like this happens, you know, if you sit around and you, and you mope, you're dead. And you might as well try and make something of it. And I think that that's, that's what we've tried to do. Uh, and it took us a while, but we all sat down and talked about it, uh, you know, after a certain period of time. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's certainly made us move a little faster and uh, work a little harder. One of the things it's done is, is that I appreciate people for their day. I don't let people go away without saying goodbye, you know, I love you and whatever, because in this case, um, you know, we might not have ever had, I never had the chance to do that. Ruth Dwyer lost her father when she was 29 years old. I was young, you know, unexpectedly from a heart attack. And always, you know, the loss of a parent is, has a huge impact in your life, especially if it's young. Uh, and that, you know, maybe doesn't seem young to some people, but it is young. And, and that, you know, he was 58 or whatever, that's young. So that was a huge impact. That was, you know, just a, a very unexpected loss. More recently, Ruth lost several of her beloved dogs in a freak accident. The first year I was in the legislature, uh, when I was a freshman, the, the night before I made my first, uh, reported my first bill for the Appropriations Committee, which is always a big deal, uh, I came home that night and my mom was sitting here at the kitchen counter crying. And three of my dogs had uh, gone through the ice and drowned. And Goldens. I was devastated. Ruth finds keeping busy helps her deal with the loss. It makes you stronger because you have to find resources to deal with those things. And you know, you have to, I think about the dogs, you have to still get up in the morning. Um, you know, if, if you have a loss in your life, your family member dies, you still have to get up and go do chores in the morning. You know, you can't not do that. You can't just stop doing what you do. I guess some people can, but in my life, I've never been able to. Well, he was devastated when his father died. Anthony lost his father while he was in college in Vermont. I could really sense what, in my mind, was a, a support being kicked out from under me. Um, and I think it really did um, force me to think about things a, a little differently, and knowing that he was uh, not going to be there. And, and I miss him, you know, particularly in being involved in a campaign and accomplishing the things that you accomplish in life. You can't help but think, gee, it would be great, you know, if, if Dad was here. Um, but I think one of the things his passing away also did is it raised in my mind it was a question as to whether or not I was going to go back, meaning um, back to where I grew up, or whether I was going to make uh, the real commitment to stay in Vermont, because it was about that time in my life. Um, and, uh, and, and I did decide to make the commitment to stay in Vermont. The Howard Dean that I remember from his years as Lieutenant Governor, which is when I first covered him, is still the Howard Dean I see today. The man who wakes up with a bright idea in the morning and goes out and talks about it. Ruth Dwyer is very good at speaking what's on Vermonters minds. And I think when she makes some of these statements that she's been criticized for, that's what we're hearing. He's been consistent and persistent. Yes, he's one of these, as we call them, left-wing activists, but he's still at it. I think people are confused, not listening with not agreeing with people. I think that the longer you're governor uh, and the more decisions you make, uh, the more you're gonna get people angry with you. He's the longest serving governor in modern history. I think it takes its toll on you. I think it's been tough for him. I think the last few months have been tough on him. 
the two times the Supreme Court in the last 15 or 20 or 30 years has issued really controversial rulings, I've had to deal with both of them. These customers of mine, their families, have even talked of leaving the state and of how upset they are with their elected officials and how they will put them out of office if they vote yes. I listened very carefully to the public on the issue of civil unions. I just came to a different conclusion than some members of the public did. And I think they've confused that with not listening at all. I think he's been dramatically caught off guard by civil unions. I think he saw it as, as a, a death warrant when it happened. He was uncomfortable from the moment the Supreme Court ruled, and he's been worried ever since. I think he could have taken an easy way out and not had this be such a big issue in this upcoming election. He chose not to go that route, and I think he deserves courage for doing that. You know, no one likes to be unpopular, uh, and it's hard for me to go to the parades and listen to the yells and the boos and all that kind of stuff. But I did what I thought was the right thing to do. I've always done that in Vermont. He treats people respectfully. Some people uh, mistakenly think that he's arrogant, and I think they mistake that for self-confidence. I think that what some would find arrogance uh, is just a way for him to continue to energize the people around him and to keep that motor of his going. I think I have been arrogant sometimes. Um, and or appear to arrogant anyway. It's not because I don't respect people, it's because I get impatient with people sometimes. Uh, usually I don't treat the members of the public like that, but I have treated members of the press like that sometimes. I don't like that part of myself, but it's something you live with and you try to improve. Well, you know, as a, as a parent in Burlington, I'm disappointed. It's not a one-issue campaign. I mean, even the people that you're describing have other issues that they're concerned about. There are very a lot of people say you can't live on a farm and be a governor because that's not the right experience. But I think you know, that's not true because one thing you do learn pretty early on is you have to do the necessary things first, always. The first thing you have to think about when you get out of bed in the morning, whether it's 50 below zero or 90 degrees outside, you got to think about the welfare of your animals, your livestock, your land. Uh, that's what's important. And those things always come first. No matter what's going on in your life, you got to do it. And government is a lot like that. You have to put yourself second. And the people's welfare first, and the state's welfare first, always. Hey, Rhett. Can we have your baby? Can we have your baby? I heard the other day that uh, she wasn't qualified to be governor. Uh, one thing was college. George Aiken came out of high school at 16 and he had the best uh, language in the speech. He, he cut out all the words you didn't need so people understood it. I, I always admired Harry Truman for some reason. I, he's one of my favorite presidents, and I know he was a Democrat, but he was also a farmer. He didn't go to college. You know, he was one of those people that uh, people had very low expectations for him. He was just a farmer. I thought he did a great job. I would say, number one, I try to do things right, uh, and I mean by that, you know, if you do th something only halfway rather than the right way, or you do it later rather than when you should, uh, you suffer the consequences. And, uh, you know, we all learn that the hard way, but it's a good lesson to learn and remember. And also to try to be fair to everybody and treat everybody the same. I think that's important. She hit the state house like a tornado on high heels because she's one of these people who it's, it's I know the right way to go and we're going to do it my way. And when she found out that in, it requires a majority vote to get, achieve that, she became very angry. She was very good on appropriations. I remember going in when she was on an appropriations bill. She asked a lot of questions. What's wrong with that? The top people don't want you to ruffle too much. And I like to ask questions, so I'm very sympathetic to that. I would agree with stubborn, absolutely. Uh, that's not always a bad thing, can be. Uh, you know, in horses it can be a bad thing or a good thing, and in people it's true as well. Uh, stubborn is, is a good thing sometimes, certainly, if you, you know, if you really want to, to get somewhere uh, and you really think the people want to go there and you're stubborn about that, I would say that's good, you know, that's leadership. I told her that nothing was black and white, it's gray. Um, that's hard for a lot of politicians. She has very strong beliefs. 
Uh, she's not particularly interested in compromise on a lot of issues. Uh, it's either her way or it isn't going to get done at all. And for a lot of people, that's a, a very strong position to have, and they admire that position. In a legislature that uh, needs compromise to get things done, that's a difficult position to be in. I think Ruth Dwyer is a lot like a lot of us reporters in that we sit and we question all the time. Luckily, as a reporter, I don't have to come up with a solution. I just have to come up with questions. If you read her comments in a newspaper, they seem very controversial, and they can be very inflammatory. If you hear her on the radio or see her on television, she's very soft-spoken. And the comment I get from a lot of people is, after they've heard her on the radio or see her on television, that's Ruth Dwyer? They're expecting someone to be pounding on the table and yelling and screaming, and that's not the way that she acts. And so she comes across in our different media in a very different way. It's about putting the needs of average Vermonters above the needs of big money, special interests, and big corporations that call the shots in Montpelier as well as in Washington. I think it's fair to say that I'm a committed activist and I'm someone who likes to get involved and uh, likes to make sure that people are heard um, and likes to get things done. I think it is interesting sometimes when people say, well, you know, do you come from a radical background or do you have radical views or you're running as a progressive, you must have radical policies. Um, and I say no, generally I don't. I think my policies are very much reflective of what Vermonters uh, want. No matter what comes up in a hurry, he always has a good answer. It shows me he must have a, a pretty good backing in his brain somewhere. Because uh, some of these meetings that we went to, they'd shoot some questions at him, which I would have no idea what to say. He would always have an answer, and it would be a good one. I never see him when he couldn't answer. And uh, when you get a guy like that, you know, he's a leader. Because that don't happen with everyone. His motivation is so completely grounded in the issues, in um, preserving what is best about the state in um, a well-informed understanding of uh, economic principles, environmental principles, um, social, social justice principles, and that's what's uppermost. It's not about him. When he says something, he means it. And when he was like, going to college, if I complained and said, if I read something in the paper and I complained and I said, oh, look at this, look what is going on, why do they do this? He'd say, you're not supposed to just sit there, you're supposed to do something about it. He said, that's what's the matter with people. They just talk about it, but nobody really does anything. That was his, his attitude. When he has an argument to make, he's got the research there, and he doesn't present it by yelling at you, by telling you I'm right, but by saying this is the point, and he lays out here's the evidence. Uh, and I find, uh, you know, that in, the, in that persistence is one of the most valuable qualities to have in politics. There are a lot of people who don't agree with his politics, but he knows how to talk to them. He, He's not the kind of guy who is going to make a lot of people angry, as Bernie Sanders always has done, even though he and Bernie Sanders probably share almost 100% of the, the positions on the issues. I think he is unique in many political ways in that he's not only willing to be the, the candidate, but he also does yeoman's work for the cause. What you see with Anthony Polina, certainly on the large farm bill that passed in the legislature, the prescription drug bill, and also on campaign finance reform, he had to work in the system. He had to make compromises. He had to go with the flow with the legislature if he wanted to see those bills pass. And I think that he decided he was going to work for those issues and push those boundaries as far as he could. But he also understood that he had to compromise on a lot of those issues. So I think he was he's learned uh, politically that he does have to compromise from time to time if he's going to get anything done. I see democracy in this election. I hope the turnout's really high. I hope Polina does well. We need people like him 
uh, making inroads and in different issues. And I hope Ruth Dwyer does really well too. Um, I'm not going to tell you where, about my politics, but um, every governor needs to have, you know, the bejesus scared out of him now and then. This be good. <laughs> uh, I make this presentation on behalf of the legislature, not just me. Um, it's a pleasure to present a check for $39,660 to the Richmond Free Library Development Incorporated. So, congratulations. The Dean's staff is juggling the responsibilities of being governor while trying to run an effective campaign. What we've done every single year that he's run is just try to get his message out, and that's what we're continuing to do this year. Thanks. Bye-bye. They are operating out of cramped quarters in Montpelier, sharing space with the rest of the Democratic Party. On College Street? The governor is, is I, I guess I could say, a frugal person. And he runs the, the, his campaign budget like he does the state budget. So we try to maximize our dollars and do what we have to do. Campaign manager Kate O'Connor got her political feet wet working for her dad, Tim O'Connor, when he ran for governor 20 years ago. Now, I've been with Howard Dean for 10 years. Started working with him in 1990 on his lieutenant governor's campaign and been with him ever since. Campaign 2000 is presenting some unique challenges. He does have two people running against him. They try to define him, and it's interesting because each of them has their own perspective. Um, you know, one of them says we're not doing enough, one of them says we're doing too much. You have to work twice as hard because we're getting ball swapped <laughs> from both sides. Hi, Clint. How are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Once in your lifetime, you have an opportunity to work for a candidate that embodies everything that's good about the process. Um, somebody who's not afraid to stand up and, and uh, say, hey, there's an elephant in the living room. What are we going to do about it? Um, you know, she's that type of person. Kathy Summers is a 16-year veteran of Boston politics. She came out of political retirement this year to come up to Vermont and run the Dwyer campaign. And that's probably the strongest message that I have tonight, is if we don't make some changes this time around, I don't think we'll have another chance. This is a very, Ruth is very seen in her best light when people have an opportunity to meet her, where there's no mediums in between. In. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we did the town meeting tour, and it's worked extremely well. And, uh, I mean, when you get 85 people in the small town of Groton and 100 people in the town of Randolph, uh, you know it's working. Because they knew that you'd vote no, I think. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good, how are you doing? My name is Anthony Polina, and I'm candidate for governor this year. For this campaign, we're focused on having Anthony meet as many people, obviously, as possible which sounds like a no-brainer, but it's really our style in terms of face-to-face -face contact, of a, a dialogue, an open dialogue with anybody and everybody who's willing to talk to us. We're hosting a lot of events, uh, public free events, um, just trying to get in front of as many people as possible. Campaign manager Chris Pearson has worked with Congressman Bernie Sanders he originally joined the Polina team to help raise money to qualify for public financing and wound up managing the only campaign which is being funded with public money. I think the tone of the campaign has been very positive and very focused on the issues. It's refreshing to have Anthony in the race for that reason. He, as a third party candidate, is not beholden to a lot of the big money interests that both parties are beholden to, so he's able and free to raise issues that are very important to people in Vermont, and I think, if nothing else, people are happy to have him in the debate just to broaden the discussion and raise some very important issues that otherwise wouldn't be brought up. You guys get around, huh? Right. <laughs> I think the important thing about the election of 2000, or most of our elections, is that the voter does have a choice. The worst case would be there would be no choice. Democracy is risky business. It's like uh, Mo Udall said about democracy. He says that uh, democracy is like sex. When it is good, it is very, very good. And when it's bad, it's still better than anything else. And E.B. White said it's the recurrent suspicion that over half the people are right over half the time. 
So there's going to be a lot of messiness, you know? But that's, without that messiness, there's no democracy. And it's boring. If the people of Vermont, by popular vote, select one of those three candidates, then I think that whoever is selected, I think would perform well. Because I have confidence in, in the voters to choose the best candidate. And I really hope the next governor is a moderate. Uh, whether a Republican or a Democrat, I think Vermont needs moderation, which is what I've supplied for the last nine years. I do think the government's gotten away from the focus that it should have and also the, the ability to listen to what people are really saying. I think the campaign is about us, us as Vermonters, and where we see the state going and, and how we're going to get there. And people want to be a part of that process. For further information on this and other Election 2000 programming and activities, visit our VPT Election 2000 website. This program is part of the PBS Democracy Project.